They say that good things come in small packages. Perhaps there's an inversely proportionate relationship to the quality of the thing and the size of the package it comes in. That formula suggests that great things come in tiny packages, and truly the best things are micro-sized adventures that fit in your pocket. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Mighty Max. Mighty Max is the story of a kid with a magic baseball cap and the adventures he has with his two friends. Friends might not be the right term, they certainly didn't start as his friends. See, the magic baseball hat that Max has was destined to be worn by the Chosen One in the fight against the forces of evil. His two friends are actually stewards of the Chosen One, helping to advise and protect him on his quest to save the world. One, Virgil, is the last surviving member of a race of creatures called Lemurians. He's over 10,000 years old and acts as Yoda to Max's Luke Skywalker. Two, Norman, is a nearly immortal warrior protecting Max from all manner of creatures, monsters, zombies, robots, and mutated insects, small and large. Those adventures, for the most part, center on thwarting the efforts of the evil Skullmaster's attempts to take over the world. But there are a lot of other evildoers out there to take up Max's time while Skullmaster schemes. Lava monsters, demons, mad scientists, cyborgs infected with computer viruses. Pretty standard stuff if you've accepted the position of the Chosen One. In 1987, Galoob launched Micro Machines, a line of roughly one 160th scale cars and trucks and stuff. By 1989, Micro Machines were the biggest thing in toy cars. More importantly, they had ignited a fever for micro-sized figures and playsets. In 1989, a British toy company called Bluebird Toys released a series of minifigure playsets designed to look like various makeup compacts that opened up to reveal micro-environments for the title character Polly Pocket to interact with. It was, to put it exaggeratedly, the most successful toy line ever released. But seriously, it was a wildly successful product and was distributed in North America by Mattel. Both Bluebird and Mattel were keen to expand that Polly Pocket magic to the boys' toys aisle, and in 1992, Bluebird did just that. Mighty Max launched with a series of micro playsets and figures that played up the gross and gruesome themes that marketers had been using to target kids for decades. The beauty and genius of Polly Pocket and then Mighty Max after was in the way the playsets opened up physically and imaginatively. The outside gave kids a sense of the monstrous character that Max would encounter, the dangers inside. The inside was an entire diorama, sometimes doubling or tripling as different environments or chapters of a story, brilliantly designed, sometimes incredibly complex and detailed, full of surprises. Ladders, staircases, hidden compartments, creatures and objects that on the outside appeared to be one thing and on the inside turned out to be another. Tiny stuff that fits in your pocket, easily smuggled into the most boring familial obligations, easily concealed from other kids, parents, and teachers. No kid would ever be without something to distract them from the mundanity of the adult world. In an unusual twist, the toy line came first. The original Bluebird packaging told Max's original story. Max's dad left him his old baseball cap, but this was no ordinary baseball cap. When Max turns the hat to the side like a switch. I just try to take my hat and I turn it around and it's like a switch. Suddenly the world got weird and very unfriendly. The cap had changed color. Something very strange was going on. He'd been caught in the horror zone, stumbling from one terrifying adventure to another with only cryptic clues to help him escape. He was all alone, he was scared, but he was Mighty Max and he'd get back somehow. So you've hit on my hideout, Mighty Max. Well, now it's going to hit on you. <laughs> Come, Max, meet my friends. <laughs> That'll stop you playing with my missiles. Fancy you dip in the pool. <laughs> Have a good look round, Max, because it's the last thing you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah, Max, handle his way out, or will he wind up his fate? His fate's in your hands. In a reverse of the expected order of things, Mighty Max the Toy inspired Mighty Max the Show. Mighty Max the Animated Series ran for 40 episodes over two seasons from September of 1993 to December of 1994. That's an impressive achievement at a time when broadcast restrictions were far more stringent than during the 1980s. In 1991, legislation called the Children's Television Act passed, which made it more difficult to market toys to kids via what were perceived as 30-minute commercials masquerading as entertainment. 
Mighty Max met this challenge by giving the series a loose historical and educational context. At the end of each episode, just before the credits rolled, Max would address the audience directly with some tidbit of trivia about the setting of the episode, a type of creature or animal that was featured, anything to give some of the airtime over to providing a legitimately educational component to the viewers. Mighty Max The Show was produced by Film Roman, the same production company that was responsible for The Simpsons. Simpsons? Simpsons? From 1992 to 2016, Garfield and Friends, Bobby's World, King of the Hill, Family Guy, X-Men Evolution, and many others. The cast featured animation all-stars like Rob Paulson, Frank Megatron Welker, Tony Jay, Tress McNeil, Jim Cummings, and Neil Ross, as well as prominent film and TV actors like Tim Curry, David Warner, and Richard Mall, with appearances by Rene Abergenois, Brad Garrett, and Ron Perlman. Mattel knew how to market toys, especially toys that were tied to an animated series. In this case, since several of the toys existed prior to the development of the animated series, it was possible to build episodes around the specific themes of the playsets that already existed, and then carry that formula forward as new toys and new episodes were released. On top of that, Mattel repackaged the existing toys, including an updated origin story that was more consistent with the origin that had been conceived for the show. The new story was that Max was bright and pretty good at getting in and out of trouble, but had never forgot the day he broke his mom's mysterious old statue and found the cosmic cap inside. How was he to know it made him the Mighty One, able to travel instantly from place to place by means of time portals? And how were Max, his cosmic cap, and his two friends and protectors, wise old Virgil and fearless Norman, gonna measure up against the ultimate evil of the Skull Master? Mighty Max through Bluebird and Mattel sold pocket-sized and deluxe playsets with varying degrees of complexity at different price points from 1991 through 1995. The line was finally canceled before the 1996 series could be produced, even though several items were already well on their way to being finalized. Ten issues of an Adventures of Mighty Max comic were produced by Marvel UK. One issue of a special number zero comic was produced and included with the Adventures of Mighty Max video game for the Sega Genesis. Tiger Electronics and Sistema both produced handheld games and Max could be found on sticker albums, puzzles, and lunchboxes. 40 episodes over two seasons and a successful toy line, general mass market and pop culture influence usually means a fan base that has demanded and, after 25 years, received some kind of all-encompassing home collection of the TV series that is not the case with Mighty Max. Some individual episodes have been released on VHS in the past, but there has never been an officially licensed collection of the series, and Max has never been on a video streaming service. That said, there are bootleg DVDs out there, and there's always here at the YouTubes. Mattel purchased Bluebird in 1998 just as the micro craze had pretty much run its course. The micro phenomenon touched just about every brand from Star Wars to Star Trek, Batman, Indiana Jones, James Bond, Power Rangers, Godzilla, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The market was oversaturated with tiny plastic figures and accessories. Mighty Max defied the traditional approach to toy marketing on multiple levels. It was a toy first before having an associated television series to drive exposure to. It was a product that began in the UK and migrated to the US. Three, it successfully applied a toy gimmick from a girl's toy line to a boy's toy line after a gross out makeover. Despite the fact that so many people do remember it so fondly, the toys especially, Mighty Max isn't a name that you hear very often when it comes to reboots or Kickstarter or Netflix. However, in 2015, Mattel renewed the trademark for Mighty Max, fueling speculation that they might be getting prepared to reintroduce Max and his friends, but no further movement has come since. In 2018, Polly Pocket was relaunched in a style reminiscent of the original micro figures in pocket-sized snap cases, as everything old is new again. So maybe there's a chance for Max someday. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you are not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Don't look at me like that. Share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you had any Mighty Max stuff, or even better, if you knew there was a show at all. I gotta admit, the show was more than I was expecting. While I was doing the research for this episode, excellent production, and it gets dark. Real dark, like dead main characters dark. Time to bring Max back and finish the story. Who wants to kickstart this with me? I do not. Cut. <laughs>